afternoon. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Um, for the next an hour or so, we'll be spending time together. Um, this is the very first Chablis online panel discussion hosted by the Bourgogne Wine Board. And I'm Rebecca Leung, um, a wine journalist and educator in Hong Kong. But joining us today, we have another three highly regarded wine personalities. So uh, let's introduce them. And uh, the very first one is Yang Lu, who is not in Hong Kong today. Uh, you're in Shanghai. Yang Lu, the Master Sommelier and the Bourgogne Wine, uh, official Bourgogne Wine Ambassador. And then another two ladies joining me today is Deborah Maybach, Master of Wine. And of course, Ivy Ng, another official Bourgogne Wine Ambassador in Hong Kong. Welcome, girls. Let's go back to Chablis. I have. I, I am pretty sure that you guys have been to Chablis many, many times, and uh, including myself, I've been to Chablis. And um, so, what kind of memories do you have? Like Yang, uh, we Yang, Deborah, Ivy, they are all wine experts on Chablis wines, and I was there a couple of times as, as well. So let's share some of their personal insights. Um, if you have visited the Chablis wine region, please also state in the poll. All right, so Yang, good to see you here. Yes, madam. <laughs> Would you please share with us, uh, when, was, when, when was your last time in Chablis? Uh, it's quite a while ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I think last time I went there is 2016 or 17. Okay. At least three years ago, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I cannot wait to go back. Uh, I guess it's going to be a while, but uh, mm. I know Burgundy Chablis is always one of the, probably on my top of the list. Yeah. yeah. So uh, would you please share with us about like, why is the location of Chablis being this unique? Why is it so special? I think uh, the location of Chablis is a very important part of why Chablis is special, um, being on the quite a a limitation uh, on the north boundary of the viticulture. Uh, really, you don't. You, I mean, as a grower there, as one maker there, uh, the room for error is very small. Um, it almost like on the knife edge. Um, but because it's on the knife edge, when uh, when everything aligns, uh, you make magical wines. Mm -hmm. um, I think when we, I think I'm, I'm sure you agree with me. It's it's a very peaceful town. You go there, there's not many people, you know, the, the, the air is fresh, um, uh, everything is quite clear and transparent, just like uh, Chablis wine itself. Uh, so my impression of the region, um, I had a lot of good memories, um, a lot of good wines, a lot of good restaurants. <laughs> and, yeah. um, but I think the region itself, uh, at, at that uh, at, uh, altitude, uh, latitude, uh, it really shows that the Chablis, um, it's a difficult region uh, to make wines consistently at high quality. But I think that's that forced uh, both growers and wine makers to be more cautious, to be more careful with their own work, no matter in the vineyard or in winery. Yeah, because geographically speaking, it's actually quite close to Champagne rather than the yes. rest of the Bourgogne regions, right? Yes, I mean, you know, if you go there, usually you go to Bonn, uh, in, Bur uh, in Bourgogne, and you drive about two and, about two and a half hours, go to Chablis. But if you are you visiting Champagne, sometimes it might be easier because uh, you drive from Hans uh, all the way down to Oba or Kobiba, and then it's just another 30 minutes drive when you are in Chablis. So uh, in terms of climate, in terms of uh, soil, uh, the south part of Champagne, Kobiba region, it's, it's slightly similar to, to, to Chablis. Yeah. Yes, yes. Very interesting. Thank you, Yang. And uh, how about Deborah? Hmm. When was the last time that you were in Chablis? Do you remember? Well, thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> I think we have to giggle because I was with you uh, <laughs> last time I was in Chablis, which yeah. was 2018. But I've been in Chablis many times. And I was interested to hear you ask the question about Champagne because my first visit, which I think it might have been 1998, actually followed a visit to Champagne. And my early memories of Chablis have always been, it's a bit chilly. Um, and so uh, the last two visits, though, I think maybe I got the, I arrived at the right time of year when it was a bit warmer. So we were actually there uh, one time uh, for four days, uh, which 
really brought home how tiny Chablis actually is and how powerful this name is globally. For such a tiny region, it's astonishing that the whole world, the whole wine-loving world, is very familiar with Chablis. The downside of being in Chablis for days is, well, there isn't that much to do at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a quiet little town in Chablis. But the good news is, because it is so small, there's an incredible opportunity to bump into winemakers every night, every meal in the town. But I think what struck me, uh, what I found most fascinating about our, my most recent visit, which was 2018, was the light. Mm. And Rebecca, you might remember, we went up on a hill and it's just simply watch the light change. And yep. being so far in the north, the shadows are long. Yeah. And we could watch in minutes how uh, certain slopes were deprived of light during the day during, with clouds and, of course, as we eased into sunset. And that was a really powerful lesson about how important it is to be on the right slope. And then let me tell you one of my favorite things about Chablis is it's memorizable. This is easy. This is easy to nail the top regions in Chablis and be able to speak about them with authority. Yes. And how about Ivy? Uh, when, when were you there last time? I, you know what? I think it might have been 2018 as well. Um, but look, I think, um, but every time, you know, um, I think every time I've been in the, um, the last couple of times anyway, it was part of the, the Grand Jour, Les Grand Jours de Bourgogne, uh -huh. you know, in March. Yeah. And, and I would always sort of land in Paris and drive to, you know, Chablis being the first day of the, the, you know, the five days of events, um, always drive to, you know, sort of like, you know, land at, you know, to the airport and go straight to, um, to Chablis. Yeah. And, uh, and it's always, you know, it's always, a, you know, it's like, it's very heartwarming because you've, you know, you've arrived in Bourgogne, but you're actually, you know that, you know, it's like to get to Bern at the end of the day after the tasting, you've still got a two hour drive, you know, to get to Bern. So, so it's sort of like, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing, to, you know, so that we're talking about distance, you know, it's, it's, it's actually much closer yes. to approach it from Paris and from Bern perhaps itself. Um, the other thing is, you know, just like Deborah said, it's, it's very cold, you know, it's, um, Every time you go, you sort of like you 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 remind of you know how much more north you know than it is you know compared to the rest of the the Bourgogne region. Um, but the other thing I thought about you know Chablis is you know um, if you look at the map you know a 3D map of Chablis, you actually see a lot of like you know um, small valleys you know um, that are sort of like perpendicular to the main valley. And I just thought you know if I had all the time you know a lot more time every on every visit. I would do a hiking trip in, in Chablis mm. and, and mm. I think it would be, you know, it would be really interesting to walk through the vineyards and sort of like, you know, traversing across the various, the various sort of like little valleys uh, and just feel, you know, the, clim the microclimates, you know, by being in there, you know, and see how the sun rises on one and or the sun sets on the other. I think that would be a lovely thing to do. Um, so I look forward to that day when we can do it. I, I truly do too. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of going through all these vines, Ivy, um, and, and I know that you have already given a lot of um, lectures on Chablis wines. Mm. Um, have you ever come across of people like always, you know, when they first ask about the Chablis geography and the topography, it's always about the soil. What is the special, um, the parts of the, of the soil in Chablis? Chablis is, um, is, is the, um, the one appellation, I think, in France that is most proud of its soil makeup. Um, the soil, as you, you know, uh, some of you would have um, watched the video um, at the beginning of this show, that you know, the soil of Chablis, the subsoil of Chablis, um, dates back to the Kimmeridgian period. The Kimmeridgian period is actually a part of the, um, the Upper Jurassic period, and is sort of like you know, about 150 million years ago. Um, what is very special about it is that, you know, I mean, I've got a piece, I've got two pieces actually, right in front of me, but it is, um, it is this grayish marl, um, which is a sedimentary rock. And where you see is sort of like, you know, in Chablis, the way the mid slopes, you know, uh, the, so at the bottom of the hill, you've got the, you know, sort of like limestone, you've got some, some fossils. And then as the sort of sides of the hill, it becomes sort of like this marl sort of um, stone, which is alternated, you know, with limestone. A bit like in a, in a French dessert would say it's, um, it's a millefeuille. So you have one layer of marl, one layer of you know, limestone, 
and it's this Kimmeridgian period. Um, in Chinese, in Cantonese, you might say it's Qin Chang Gou, you know, it's like something mm. like that. And, and what happens, what is very special about this Mao, this Kimmeridgian period, is that you know, this, this particular soil is characterized by the uh, small comma-shaped you know, oysters, uh, fossils, that you, know, you find you know, sort of like all throughout, you, know, sort of like you can find it sort of like a nice concentration inside this piece I've got here. And then as you go further up, and so this mid-level is where we find the Chablis, the Chablis Premier Cru, and also the Grand Cru sort of vineyards. As you go further up the hill, to the top of the hill, this marl turns into limestone, and that comes from the Portlandian period, um, which is the, um, um, the sort of the, um, the, the very, um, just um, at the upper edge of the um, Jurassic, upper Jurassic period. And this Portlandian period is probably about 145 million years ago. And that is a very compact limestone. You don't see uh, these uh, fossils that we talked about here. But it gives you sort of like, you know, um, the Puti Chablis Appalachian and also a part of the Chablis Appalachian. So, you know, when we talk about today, we're focusing on the Chablis Appalachian. So there are two types of soil that are relevant. Most is Kimmeridgian, but we also find some Portlandian um, at the top of the, uh, of the slope. Thank you, That's Ivy. It. That's yeah. a great explanation, Ivy, and I, I just want to add to it. It's, it's the only wine region I've been to in the world where the winemaker will the actually yes. <laughs> hit the rocks together, yeah. you know, and say, smell the rocks. So, That's right. <laughs> yes. And even now, even through this mask, I can smell that incredible aroma <laughs> reflective of the site. So you really do get a sense of the seafood, uh, mm -hmm. in the, the sea life that yes, was once alive stone. in these yes. stones. Yes. Well, uh, after seeing the polls, um, uh, among our audiences, there are around slightly over 30% of um, the attendees, they have been to Chablis, and then the rest, they have never been to Chablis. So for those of the people who do not um, have the experience of traveling in Chablis, Deborah, how do they access to the wines and taste the wines and taste the rocks that you've just shown us? How do they access <laughs> it in Hong Kong now, Rebecca? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, Chablis has an astonishing presence in the market. And uh, as I said, this is a tiny little place. And it's extraordinary that it is so dispersed in our markets. We're extremely lucky to have access almost everywhere. In fact, there have been a number of, of surveys and a, quite a bit of research in this market. And uh, in a survey of 200 restaurants in Hong Kong that that do carry wine. I think it was 41% of them actually do have Chablis on the list. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very accessible wine. And something that's wonderful about Chablis is I am absolutely convinced you can achieve quality at every price point. This isn't always true of all wine regions in the world. Um, and Chablis actually is, is quite uh, well imported into the Hong Kong market generally. Um, it did go down a bit this year, of course, because it's a very popular on-trade wine. And as we all know, the on-trade has slipped a touch mm -hmm. this year. Thank you, Deborah. So uh, we have actually um, talked, you know, uh, slightly touched on, upon on the, um, on the appellation. So basically, Chablis is composed of, the, of four appellations. One is um, Petit Chablis, and then um, Chablis and then um, the Grand Cru, uh, the Premier Cru, and then the Grand Cru. So uh, what are these appellations representing for you? Uh, Yang, would you like to share with us? Uh, you mean the, the appellations? The level or the Grand Cru? Uh, uh, Petit Chablis, Chablis, Chablis Premier Cru, and Chablis Premier Cru. What are these appellations appearing, um, representing for you? Um, do you have a lot of experience in uh, serving, you know, the village appellation and um, are they particularly popular in hotel, you know, for guests in China, for example? Yeah, I think uh, overall, uh, uh, I agree with Deborah that uh, Japan actually present a, a very good value. Um, I think uh, no matter it's from the PD Japan all the way to Grand Cru level, um, it's it's still I mean comparatively it's still rather affordable to wine lovers. Mm -hmm. uh, if you compare it to all the top um, Grand Cru and top producers in 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 Coco 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 Co
Uh, Felicia Blee is quite easy going. Um, we don't age it, uh, we serve it by glass. Sometimes we use it for banquet as well, uh, for larger title events. Um, and uh, usually we try to consume them as young as possible. I mean, I'm not saying they're not ageable, but uh, I think it's best to enjoy them once they're a little bit young and fresh. And when it comes to Chablis level, uh, a lot of our hotels uh, and a lot of restaurants in Hong Kong and China, we, uh, we serve it by glass. Uh, and I think, okay. uh, again, it's a very good entry point for people, for consumers who just get into start drinking wine um, or start to, start to uh, want to enjoy more bourbon wines. And when it comes to premium crew and grand crew level, we tend to list the wines that we slightly age uh, on one list. Uh, because with age, I mean, first of all, these wines are, are very suitable for aging uh, with their concentration, yeah. with their dry extract, with their, uh, with their uh, acidity level. Uh, so they're very suitable for aging. And when with aging, they, can be, they, they develop more nuanced aroma, more, more, more complex aromas. So when we list wines uh, from premium program crew, we try to have some wines with age. And also, I think no matter if it's PD, uh, PD all, the way, uh, all the way to Grand Cru, I think another advantage of Chablis wines is they're very good wines for pairing food uh, because they're sharpness, uh, because, because they're uh, kind of more linear structure, uh, but still you have a lot of minerality, which brings a lot of freshness from the seafood. And uh, also Chablis is more, more diverse mm -hmm. than most consumers think. You know, you have Chablis that is very straight, very steely, uh, very, very, very sharp, but also you still have Chablis that is quite structured. Uh, some of them uh, are being fermented aging oak, which has some secondary aromas. Yeah. Uh, so there are different types of Chablis that uh, uh, the style that actually can suit for different uh, consumer with different preference. So I think that's a, it's, it's a very diverse region as well, more diverse than most consumers think about them. Yeah. And uh, but I think in the end, when we when we sell Chablis or when we pitch Chablis to consumers, um, I think there's a, a few keywords that we always use. Uh, mm -hmm. Purity, mm -hmm. uh, clarity, and the transparency. Yeah. Uh, I think... That's three uh, words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening. I'm sorry, I'm too much. <laughs> clarity and transparency. But I'm yeah, sure it's very true. That's three words. <laughs> three words. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, Deborah, um, you've been running the Cathay Pacific, mm. um, the HKIWSC, for many years, and um, uh, we have a very special pairing competition that is uh, tasting the wines uh, together with the food. Do you find the Chablis wines to be a winner in many, many um, perspectives here when pairing with wines? Well, with the HKI WSC, Chablis always does well because mm -hmm. it has so much flexibility and the food pairing portion of the wine competition involves uh, dishes that are popular or typical throughout Asia. And of course, many, many of these dishes feature seafood. So it's, it's a natural fit with seafood. But for me, when I think about Chablis, unless it is oak aged uh, Chablis, when I think about Chablis, I imagine a squeeze of lemon, and I try to think what dishes will taste delicious with a squeeze of lemon, mm -hmm. and that will be a dish that suits Chablis perfectly. And as we know, that is a wide range of dishes, and it's one of the few wines that actually pairs beautifully with vegetables, um, with you know dark greens and with, with salads, which are not always an easy match. But I'd have to also mention, Rebecca, you, you said the words Cathay Pacific, and I thought you might be asking me a different question because I'm the consultant for Cathay Pacific and mm -hmm. Cathay Dragon. And we've always had a Chablis on board. It's yeah. super popular, and it's always been a, a puzzle to me in, in the one sense because I think we tend to think of Chablis as a, a sort of tight wine, not super forthcoming. And those are the wines we usually avoid in the air. We need more mm -hmm. energy and flavor in the air. But Chablis performs really well in this setting. And maybe it's the passengers drinking it with caviar, but yeah. also the passengers enjoying it with salty snacks. It's, wow. it's a perennial favorite. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. So how about Ivy? I know you're a cheese expert, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have any recommendation when it comes to Chablis? Mm -hmm. 
and cheese. Are they a, a good pairing? Um, you know, are, are they good matching? Uh, yeah. So, um, so um, as you know, sort of Bourgogne is the um, is a as a as a gourmet is a land of the gourmets. You know, and they um, they have a number of cheeses that come from you know that come from uh, Bourgogne region. So, but uh, you know, for me, I think Chablis is very good. Could be with um, you know of the acidity. And because it's got, you know, I mean, we're talking about sort of Chablis at different levels as well. So sort of like, you know, some more structured than others, some more, you know, sort of like more vibrant than others. So maybe the more vibrant style, you know, I could easily pair it with, you know, for example, a goat cheese from the region, the Chacolé, um, mm. which is, um, which is, you know, um, which is, you know, delicious, you know, sort of like, you know, uh, as a young Chacolé, then I think it's perfect with the, uh, with the, with the Chablis, you know, in, the, in this full vibrancy. Um, the Chablis with a bit more structure, you know, perhaps in you know, a bit more, you know, sort of like uh, body, uh, sort of a bit more sort of aging on the leaves, a bit more, um, more of that sort of fleshiness. Then perhaps, you know, something like a, um, um, a Bria Safran, which can be also made in the, from the Bourgogne region, that could be very mm -hmm. good with the, um, um, you know, with the, with the pairing as well. Um, mm -hmm. I think generally Chablis for me is, um, is um, it's a very unpretentious wine, sort mm. of like you know. It's uh, for me that's that's the thing about you know the most the most important thing about Chablis is unpretentious. It's got no oak treatment, so it doesn't get in the way of you know um, pairing with certainly not pairing with cheese and certainly not pairing with any types of food. Um, it's like a good chef, right? If you have a great ingredient, why mask it with a lot of other things? You know, it just shows so beautifully on its own without you know a lot of you know added materials. So I think um, that's Chablis for me. All right, well, thank you so much. It's really making me hungry. <laughs> so let's move on to the vintages. Because 2018 uh, is, a, you know, is a, it's a blessing to a lot of the um, wine producers in, in Chablis because I still remember that last time when I was there in 2018. Uh, that was spring with Deborah. And uh, we actually saw, you know, we have talked with a lot of the winemakers and they were kind of, um, you know, worried about the 2017 vintage. We'll be talking about this later. But 2018 appeared to be a very uh, promising vintage. So, Deborah, um, do you think this was uh, th this was the year of us, you know, in, <laughs> in Chablis? So, what do you think of the uh, 2018 overall? Well, I'm happy to report, Rebecca, we could drink our anniversary <laughs> wine for many years. <laughs> 2018 is just a fantastic vintage, and I love what the producers themselves are saying about the vintage. This is our comeback vintage. Yeah. This is the best vintage in 20 years. This is the best gift after two years of more difficult vintages. And we saw that generosity in the glasses we tasted today. And um, what makes this such a great vintage, of course, they had a <clears throat> very high water table left over from the winter. So there was a lot of ground water available to the vines. And they had very low frosts. As, as everyone knows, Chablis has frosts every year. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. <coughs> and in fact, the frost was not fighting so hard, not fighting the producers so hard this year. So um, there were not issues in terms of uh, damaging bud break. Mm -hmm. And then as they went into flowering, they had a bit of hail. And sadly, it, it did hit a couple of communes that yes. had hail the previous years. But in general, even the hail was was generous and then they had this incredible warm dry summer and in fact some of the producers were almost on the verge of worrying about rainfall which is extraordinary there um, but they did have this deep water table so really they had perfect conditions for Shapley and what does perfect conditions means for them is that they really have the time to harvest plot by plot they have consistent bud break, consistent flowering. So this is the, the perennial challenge for this region is some of the fruit will be ripe with it, with, on the vine faster than some of the other fruit because of damage from the weather conditions. And they face none of that this year. And mm -hmm. can I just add, Rebecca, I saw somebody ask, can we get more Chablis? <laughs> and I think it's important to understand how tight the supply of Chablis actually is and in fact, uh, Chablis imports increased in 2019 in Hong Kong mm -hmm. because the 18 vintage was more generous. 
and the yields in the previous two vintages were not. So it's not just a matter of getting on the right allocation list, knowing the producers. The producers themselves have limitations based on the weather with what they can provide our markets. Yes, thank you, Deborah. Uh, Ivy, what do you think of the 2018 vintage? Do you think the, both the quantity and the quality is a great match and, uh, when compared to the previous year? I think the, the quality of the 2018 has really surprised us, you know, as Yang and Deborah have um, alluded to, sort of like, you know, mm -hmm. these are generous, expressive wines, you know, um, and, and we have the quantity to, uh, to, to actually reward the consumers as well. You know, it's, it's a perfect vintage for, you know, you can drink them young because they're so approachable. And we can also, they also have the structure, the, you know, the, the freshness, the structure to actually age. So I think it's, um, it's been, it's sort of like, you know, after a, a disappointing in terms of volume for the 2017 and 16, um, 2018 has really returned, you know, sort of like some, the, to the market, something, you know, that the, uh, the consumers love, you know, to, you know, and, and we just get, we can get more of it, you know. Um, I mean, we've tasted um, four of the wines from the 18 vintage. And what is quite interesting is that, you know, um, obviously for Chablis, sort of like, you know, we, um, there was um, there's the, the sort of like the um, the comparison with champagne perhaps, perhaps doesn't just stop at you know sort of like you know the, um, the the location but also the northness of it but also Chablis um, if you make Chablis that you know uh, and you're a large producer you can actually have the ability to blend different um, vineyards you know different climas together different you know plots parcels together but whereas for the smaller you know um, dom um, domains you know the smaller vignerons you perhaps have less ability to, um, or, you know, le um, a little bit, you know, fewer options to blend. And 18 has really rewarded, the, you know, the um, I think the smaller vignerons because the 18 has, you know, come up so well in quality. And you know, I mean, I've got in my glass here the um, uh, the fourth wine that I've got, you know, which is a, um, a particular clima um, between Bayon and uh, Forêt Montmain. And it's sort of, you know, it's north and sort of like northwest facing. So in a warm vintage, in a hot, you know, sort of like, you know, and slightly more dry um, vineyard um, vintage, it's actually showing very well, you know, and it's, you know, t it's taken the, uh, the 12 months, you know, in neutral barrels, you know, very nicely as well. So I think it's, um, it's a fantastic vintage, you know. Um. It is. It's a beautiful vintage. So mm. speaking of the 2018 being a blessed vintage, that means like, you know, in Chablis, they, uh, they do have some disease threats um, throughout the year. And uh, do you think having um, organic farming here is a big challenge? Because in, meanwhile, in Chablis, we have uh, a total of 8% of the organic vineyards. And do you think that we will be expecting um, more vineyards going into organic farming? Or um, do you have any other comments, Yang? Ideally, yes. All right. I mean, we are living in a world that uh, I think this year is eye-opening for all of us. Even though COVID is nothing related to to wine or agriculture, but uh, mm -hmm. in the bigger picture, we have to understand that uh, you know it's just not us living in, in this uh, on this beautiful planet. So ideally, yes. Uh, hopefully, um, we can see organic agriculture growing more and more. Uh, and personally, as a sommelier, you know, you know, sommelier always like to share stories to the consumers, to our guests, mm -hmm. and you know, being being, being green or being organic or biodynamic is always a big part of our story. But in the end, it's about quality. Uh, in the end, it's about you, you have to make enough wines to survive, and you have to make uh, good wines to to, uh, to 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 put on the market. You know, uh, that means sometimes you can not be super organic mm -hmm. i mean personally i'm fine with it you know and uh, organic it's it's a, it's a very healthy way it's uh, it's um, i think it's a possible way to move forward uh, but uh, i don't think organic purely means quality so but if you can be both organic and high quality for me that would be great uh, so what i'm trying to say is um, make the best one possible and i think uh, for those quality conscious producers they will try to be as green as organic can be. Mm -hmm. Are they certified? Maybe not. Are they 100% uh, according to the organic certification? Maybe not. But I think they are always very cautious on what they do. So I think that's already for me good enough. Yes. Okay. 
So in France, there is a certification called High en Environmental Value Certification. And basically, it covers four key areas. That is the biodiversity conversation, plant protection strategy, um, and uh, very, uh, the fertilizer management, as well as the water resource management. So uh, today, there are actually 30 domains that are HVE certified. And uh, Ivy, do you think it's a good trend for the region? And uh, do you think when, when you're hosting wine classes, are the uh, stu wine students interested in knowing more about the, the certification in France? Um, I think it's um, students may not have the, um, the level of knowledge you know, the, um, of HVE or HEV um, in English. It's, um, but I think it's a very, it's a very, um, pl you know, um, plausible thing, and it's very sort of, you know, um, commendable that the the growers are trying their hard, despite all the challenges, to sort of like, you know, be H um, V E certified. And I think it's, um, um, and I think, you know, what it means to students, what it means in terms of wine, you know, the people who are learning about wine, is that it's a grower who is very um, careful, who who wants to preserve. The, gen the, the vineyards and the vines for the next generation and you know to keep you know producing continuously producing um, good mm -hmm. good wine you know from healthy great uh, vines you know or, you know throughout the generation so I think that's uh, that's the probably the more important message is that we are able from this generation on to pass on to the next generation something that is um, sustainable something that is um, that is a legacy um, of you know uh, the quality of the of the vineyards Mm -hmm. And Deborah, um, absolutely, I agree with Young and Ivy about this this topic. And I think you know many of us realize there are regions around the world with sustainability programs, whether they're organic or sustain sustainable growing. We have to applaud them all. And I just want to add, we are the professionals. What, when I have a party and people come to my house. I can hear them repeating your voices, what you have told them about the wine that gives them pride about the wine. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm speaking to you earnestly. It's, it's our job to make the consumers excited about these programs and, a, and the sustainability efforts that winemakers are making to preserve the future of this industry. Mm -hmm. We have to get these consumers excited about it. We have to speak with pride. Yes. 2017, a very challenging one. Young, you were in you were in Chablis in 2016, though, right? But you you're familiar with the 2017 vintage. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you heard a lot of um, comments from the winemakers saying that oh, it's uh, a very challenging one? It's a painful vintage. Let's put it this way. Yeah, it's, it's uh, especially after 2016, which is. Uh, also a quite a frost damaged, a low yield vintage. And I think in 2017, slightly better than 2016. Uh, 16, I think they lost about 50% of crop. And in 17, we lost about one third of usual crop. Um, but I think uh, the different thing is uh, in 2017, a lot of premier crew and ground crew got being hit uh, severely. And uh, for us as a, as a trade, as a, as a sommelier, uh, we see the price increase a little bit. Also for the, the top domains, we see our allocation being reduced as well. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of style and in terms of quality, uh, quality uh, I, I very much prefer, uh, prefer 2017, uh, the style it has. Uh, I know a lot of producers probably prefer 2016, um, but I think for 17, it, it's a vintage uh, that uh, in terms of quality, uh, all the ones I have tasted that I really, really like them. I think they have a certain tension, uh, they have certain nerve, uh, they are more classic to what I'm used to of, uh, of drinking Chablis. And I think, uh, yes, the, color, the quantity reduced uh, significantly, but uh, I think the, the, the quality still remains one of the top ones in the past few years, probably in the past decade, that, that, uh, decades. So um, I, I do like the, the, they, are, they, are, they, they do have concentration, but they're not heavy. Um, uh, they, they show tremendous minerality. Uh, which should us, uh, but I think in 2017, because of the weather, uh, weather condition, uh, the minority is more pronounced, uh, and I think uh, it, it's easier for us to communicate this one to the to the guests. Yeah. 
So with the frost attacking the vineyards, how do they deal with the uh, with all these frost? Like ivy, um, they used to use candles and some aspersion. Do you see the vineyard home using any other means to handle the situation? Or Deborah or Ivy? Yeah, I think what a really promising technique is actually uh, electrical wires. Mm -hmm. uh, so wires run along the training wires, but they're able to just very gently heat the area to prevent. And to me, I'm very excited about that particular technique because it's very low intervention. Mm -hmm. But that, it's quite a costly uh, installation, isn't it? Well, that is the problem, Rebecca, and so far I've only seen it in the Grand Cru vineyards. But I'm mm -hmm. hopeful that uh, once it's a proven and success that we'll see more and more of this technique being used. Yeah, because I, 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 even using candles, it's very labor intensive. Mm. And uh, it's, it, but, and sleepless nights anyway, the, you know, the, the, the vineyard staff, they are waking up every, you know, 15 minutes going out and check the vineyard. So Ivy, do you have anything to add about the, the frost fighting measures of the No, I vineyard? think it's yeah. like, you know, I think we it's um it's a it's a at the end of the day it's cost, you know, it's a balancing act. We, you know, do you sort of like put the cost, you know, can you invest in something more height, you know, technology or can you know do you have the labor to and do you have the people, you know, who who don't mind sort of like losing sleepless nights and go out and put the sort of like the, the candles or the smoke pots, you know, to sort of like prevent the frost from, you know, sort of damaging your um, your grapes. So, um, but also it's sort of like having the, you know, if it's um, the the ambient humidity, so it's also a big sort of like um, consideration as well. So if the, you know, if you have, you know, frost, you know, sort of like um, risk, but you have, you know, the actually in you know, the humidity in the in the area is, you know, relatively high, then your, you know, your risk is actually a little bit lower. So it's sort of like, you know. Um, I, I guess sort of like, you know, the, what I've been sort of reading is that, you know, people are, you know, growers, vineyards are paying much more attention to whether reports are working much closer with, you know, sort of like um, uh, the wine boards, you know, for sort of the most updated, you know, sort of, and they're helping each other as well. Mm -hmm. They're sharing information. I think it's sort of like, you know, it's a case of investment, sharing information and being just more alert in general. Right. And what do you think of the wines of 2017, Deborah and Ivy? I was, uh, you know, it's always interesting listening to winemakers because they can say it's a really tough vintage, but they might not be talking about the result in the glass. They may be talking about the effort it took uh, to see the vintage through. And I actually find 2017 a really nice vintage. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I didn't have to go right light the frost candles. And so I think um, this is, as Young alluded to, this is a vintage to me that is classic Chablis. It's, it's restrained, uh, uh, it, it's crisp, it's pure. Uh, it's not an opulent vintage, that's true, but I don't expect opulence from Chablis. And I also think it's interesting, these tough conditions ensured that the grape skins were quite thick mm -hmm. and the juice, so the skin to juice ratio was perhaps a bit unusual. But let's not forget, there's so much flavor in a thick-skinned grape. And I feel that there's actually quite a lot of phenolic flavor that came through into these wines. Yeah. And I'm just frankly saying they were more delicious than I expected after reading all of the press about this top vintage. Yeah, yeah I, I, I actually quite like the 2017 uh, wine. Um, 2018 is a really charming, wine, but 2017 is quite a classic, and I really like the crisp part of it. OK, so shall we move on to the 2019? I didn't study this vintage in depth mm -hmm. myself, but uh, I know that the producers are quite pleased with conditions, and they had a much more sort of stable summer compared to, mm -hmm. say, even 18 had a bit of a gloomy July and had fears around botrytis and other issues. But 2019 seemed quite smooth sailing. I have tried uh, the wines, and um, of course, at this stage, they're so tight, they're yeah. so young and, and sharp, but I thought the acidity was particularly appealing. It was quite a chalky style, mm. uh, powdery style of acidity, which I think is, is uh, you know, a really nice hallmark style for Chablis. 
Yeah, well, actually the 2019 is quite a, a hot and dry year, and, um, but the, the acidity is preserved um, after all these um, ups and downs, and um, maybe some of the vineyards, they have uh, some dried you know, grapes, which are slightly dried, but they are, in, generally, in general, it's, it's quite a, a quality vintage. And I have tasted the 2019, yes, I agree, it's quite tight at the moment, but um, it's, it's still having that classic shabby pure, pureness in there. Ivy, what do you think of this uh, 2019 vintage? Well, the, uh, the 2019 vintage actually had a very slow start because they were, it was actually initially rather cool. So the, the, slow, um, the, the slow vegetative growth you know, um, was going to always going to end up in a, a later harvest. And then when the, you know, July and uh, when August came, they had actually had a, a heat wave, you know, that they you know, weren't sort of like, you know, um, that was kind of almost taking them not quite by surprise, but after a frost period in May, this was sort of like, you know, this was probably not, they, weren't, they were worried that the grapes were not ready for it, you know, to prepare for it. Um, what we actually ended up was, uh, so like we had a, a situation of mille in um, quite mm -hmm. a few areas. So we had sort of like uneven sized grapes and, and that, that might you know, have been sort of like a cause for some um, um, delight because you know, the, the grape, you know, the, the wine ended up being quite very well balanced. So that it might be the sort of like the better skin to um, pulp racial as a result of the, uh, of the mille rondange. So that was the um, um, that was a 2019 vintage, being in, in the end, you know, very balanced, and you know, sort of um, very aromatic at the same time. Do you think global warming is affecting the region, Yang? Definitely, I think mm -hmm. global warming is uh, affect every part, every aspect of our life, not only wine, but everything. I think global warming. Uh, I think global warming might not be the most accurate word to use. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be climate change. I think it's more more accurate, more precise. Mm -hmm. I think with all the hail, uh, with all the frost, uh, with all the irregularity of the weather pattern, um, it's it's affecting the the region definitely. I think also not only on the weather side, not only on the climate side. For example, this is very dry as well. As you mentioned, as I mentioned, 2019 also has a dry spell as well. But also, I think uh, climate change does also create certain disease problems that are, uh, you know, kind of interrelated to the, to the, to the, to the global warming or climate change. So, yes, I think it's, it's, a, it's a serious topic. Um, but I think for, for maybe for Chablis, uh, it is, it's a plus in, 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 in Hayden. I don't know. I think yeah. uh, uh, there's a certain silver lining we can say that uh, uh, grape does get ripener in some years. Um, yeah. like just like all the regions in the northern part of the world. And, uh, uh, but I think it, 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 climate change does create a lot of other issues uh, that is related to the viticulture that we have to really be careful. And uh, a lot of them we haven't experienced before. So as a grower, uh, they encounter new problems uh, that they never faced before every single year. Yes. Deborah, uh, what do you think of this climate change? Well, I was going course. to make the exact same point where, that Yang has already, uh, but that we, we can't think of it as global warming. I mean, that global warming for Chablis probably would be a nice, nice gift um, to be just a touch warmer, but that's not what actually happens. It means that they get their frost at odd, different times. They, uh, their harvest dates are changed, their vulnerability to hail, their vulnerability to pests, their vulnerability to molds are, are shifting on them. And uh, one thing that I was struck by when I was listening to all the winemakers talk about these last three vintages, and they kept using the same word over and over, precoz, like it's precocious, it's precocious, meaning, mm. you know, quiet, surprising and smart and early, and they seem still quite uh, surprised by these harvest states and these conditions. And so I also think, you know, this, these are challenging times for the growers to really uh, be able to understand what to expect and how to translate what they get into a classic Chablis style. Yes. Ivy, do you think um, the Vigneron are doing 
something slightly different from like two decades ago because of the climate change or um, any special you know, change of uh, winemaking as well? Well, there's certainly sort of like looking at, you know, um, um, ways, you know, to, to improve the, to let the vines, you know, adapt better to the tr changes in the climate. You know, and actually, as we've seen, sort of like, you know, throughout the tasting here today, um, 17, 18, and 19, with um, quite different sort of like, you know, um, ch sort of growing season sort of like um, weather patterns, um, we've seen actually the, vi the wine has, you know, d um, turned out, you know, very balanced mm -hmm. and very expressive and very aromatic. And so I think the vines themselves are doing most of the work. The vignerons are just there to help them along. The vines are actually doing the work of adapting to the climate change you know, that we are all facing. And the vignerons are doing their bit by sort of like, you know, for example, um, they're sort of you know, not plowing so much during the dry periods and they're doing less pruning, for example, if, it's, you know, um, you know, if they used to do a lot more green pruning, they're doing a, a lot less. Um, and they're just you know, really trying to sort of let the vines you know, do the job themselves. So, so I would say, yes, the vineyards might have to sort of like take a shorter summer holiday because the, the harvest <laughs> is getting earlier and earlier, but, you know, and organize their labor better. But you know, the, the real laborers, you know, the real, real people, the workers, are the vines themselves. They have to work harder to adapt. Yes. Speaking of um, uh, you know, um, adapting, it's very hard for us to adapt to the, uh, the situation this year because <laughs> 2020 is apparently a very special vintage. Um, but well, we don't have the wines here yet. And uh, I don't think any of us here have been traveling lately. Um, but let's also talk about the 2020 vintage. Um, it's an early vintage. Um, again, it's, it's quite a hot and dry year. Yang, have you? ever talked with any friends in Chablis about this vintage? Not only Chablis particular, uh, talk with some uh, domains in Bogong as well. I think at first uh, they are quite worried. Um, it's quite dry, as you mentioned, and quite warm. And it's one of the earliest harvest ever in the history. Um, but that, honestly, I think every time we talk with them, and uh, at this moment, they are pretty confident uh, with the quality, how it turned out. But still, I think it's too early to say. I think the best time to go to taste the wine is probably after May, when all the mellow is finished. Um, but I think they are pretty optimistic, at least from what I heard. But, you know, never be one nature, you have to be yourself. <laughs> 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 yeah. Ivy, what do you think of this uh, 2020 vintage? Have you ever heard anyone from Chablis about seeing, well, say, sharing with you their difficulty of um, sending staff into the vineyards and work and, and even in the cellar? Um, no, I've just, I mean, just listening to Anne Mohu, you know, earlier, um, talking about the 2020 vintage, you know, being um, a classic one, you know, she described it as a classic vintage, you know, bring back the freshness and also sort of like, you know, um, good um, phenolic ripeness. So she was almost comparing it with the, the balance that we also saw in 2017. So I, I think it's, um, um, it would, you know, it's, a har it's an early half uh, you know, vintage, but it's nothing like what we saw, for example, in 2003. It's nothing compared to that. You know, it's, it's, it's a very different um, you know, style of vintage altogether. You know, we're getting the early harvest, but we're also getting a classic style. So something, something probably we've not seen yet, you know, something very good to come um, mm -hmm. as we go into taste the wines in, you know, in the next 12 or 18 months time. Hopefully. Mm. <laughs> Deborah, 2020. Taste the wines in Chablis. Not this way. <laughs> <laughs> Better not. Deborah, would, would, um, have you ever, ever had any discussion with the trade people saying that 2020, apart from having all these classic vintage wines and then, uh, but with all the lockdowns of these countries here, are the trade facing a lot of difficulty in selling the wines and um, do they have any uh, you know, ideas in fitting into the new normal, just like now what we're having, seeing each other virtually? How do we adapt to this? Well, I think it is a challenging time, uh, in particular for Chablis in Hong Kong, because 
it is such a strong performer in the entree. Um, some surveys we have show that of, uh, say, 30 specialty retail outlets, um, uh, they have a, a mix of Chablis that runs from um, Grand Cru to Premier Cru, of course, and to AC Chablis. And it's the AC Chablis that's suffering in terms of market uh, purchase because uh, the retail outlets still attract collectors and mm -hmm. kind of high knowledge um, uh, consumers. So I think it's, it is something to consider in terms of your portfolio and perhaps you know, aggressively pursuing your Grand Cru customers for now. In the restaurants, the mix normally, kind of typically, would be 41% Chablis AC, and then 33% Premier Cru, 21% uh, Grand Cru, and then, of course, 12% uh, Petit Chablis, mm -hmm. a casual corner used more typically for banquet wines. So normally, there's quite an even split in the on-trade, but when it comes to the off-trade, it's not so well balanced, and I think we need to think carefully how to support the producers. Now, some trends I've noticed in the market generally and where the opportunity might be. I'm listening to all these mums with homeschooling mm -hmm. or people that are working from home. And one thing that I've seen, uh, I'm hearing or observing over and over, they don't have a way to distinguish my work day is done or my <laughs> homeschool day is done. And what I'm hearing from these ladies is they're starting to open bottles around 4 or 5 p.m. But uh, <laughs> they need something kind of light mm -hmm. and crisp, not too heavy, not too obvious. Um, and it's their way of saying, my work day is done, and I now deserve something special. So to me, there's a real opportunity there for Chablis, because yeah. it is the kind of wine that whets the appetite. Thank you. And Ivy, do you think any uh, new ways of uh, wine education coming up soon, or um, it will be a lot of virtual education going on soon, later in the future, or um, any wow. suggestion? If, if I had the crystal ball, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's. Um, I, I think we have all lived through this year, um, doing our best to continue to promote wine education. Um, with, uh, and most of it online, but you know, um, in the in every way we can. Um, I think it's. Um, I think what would be interesting, perhaps, you know, just um, it's quite difficult. I mean, sort of like you know, I was just thinking about Deborah's point. You know, um, if you're at home, you know, you like something fresh and you sort of drink it. But it's um, you know, a full bottle may be a little bit you know too much for one person. Um, actually, at home, I've been sort of like, you know, we've been ordering some half bottles of Chablis, mm. <laughs> actually. And I always feel very not, you know, I don't feel guilty about opening that half <laughs> bottle by myself because it's, uh, it's nice and refreshing and rewarding at the end of the day. Um, it's, it's really a very good aperitif drink. Um, and it, it kind of like, you know, takes you through to the evening to your, you know, little snacks, you know, before dinner. Um, and so I, I think maybe... Maybe sort of like not so much about the you know my in the, to answer your question I was thinking you know maybe something to think about for the um, for the industry is sort of like you know more half bottles of Chablis mm. um, and they also closed not just you know then I the ones we've got at home anyway at, um, they're not closed with the um, the, na the natural corks they're all closed with DM corks yeah. and they are kept extremely fresh you know so there's no you know sort of like there is um, there is a lot of you know, assurance that we're going to enjoy that, you know, sort of like that nice freshness you know, uh, with a lot of minerality. Um, but it takes practice, you know, as Yang said. You know, it's not for the new um, wine drinkers. It's certainly you know, that minerality needs to be um, appreciated you know, over time um, with people who, um, who appreciate it. So a um, little bit difficult to do it online with, you know, to sort of like you know, to... Um, to share this, you know, experience of minerality together, perhaps, you know, but I, I hope, I hope one day we'll all be able to sit down together, all four of us, you know, and, um, and share a glass of Chablis. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, it's, it's, I think, um, for the, for the wine making, the viticulture, the, all the vigneron and winemakers, they have a lot of things to learn and practice, and same for us in the market as well. Uh, for all those of us who work in different positions in the industry, as well as the consumers, we are now learning and adapting 
to uh, a new norm. So um, meanwhile, we have uh, concluded our, our d discussion panel here, but uh, do we have any questions or special remarks about the wines or the vintage, or do you have any questions that you'd like to address to any of us? All right, so let me repeat the question and see. Uh, okay, from Yu Kong YK Chao. Uh, will global warming affect the unique style of Chablis in the coming years? So I guess uh, Yang has already talked about, um, and, and Deborah as well, about the climate change. Uh, Yang, do you have any remarks to add? Or Deborah? I think. I, I think um that's worry the things that you, we can control about. You know, I mean, <laughs> if climate change just happen, which is happening, I mean, it's, it's not well happening, it's happening already. Um, but I think leave that to, uh, to the to the one makers and in neurons to figure out what's best way to move forward. You know, um, as, a, as, as a trade, especially working for arm trade as a, uh, as a small name myself, you know, we just present the best possible ones to the to the guests. To the guests, you know, there are certain things we can control. There are certain things we cannot control. So, do not worry too much about the things you cannot control. Yeah, Deborah, do you have anything to add? Well, that was so beautifully put, Young. I <laughs> really appreciate your words, and um, he's absolutely right. We can't control anything uh, specifically, but we can all do our small part mm -hmm. uh, with our own efforts here locally. Uh, to protect the environment, of course. Um, some of the things that might change um, if, if, uh, if moisture patterns change, just, just say that moisture is delayed a week, that means the frost threat changes completely hmm. because frost is heavy dew that has frozen on the ground. I grew up with frost myself. Um, and uh, that happens in a foggy, humid environment, that these things settle on the ground and then they freeze, roughly. So um, it won't take much to change. And all I can say is let's hope these changes that the vignerons are facing are just small changes for them in ways that perhaps enhance their yields. Right. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Um, the next question is uh, from Tina Xie. Um, is there a trend to block MLF, that is the, the malolactic fermentation, and also reducing the use of SO2? Ivy or um, Deborah mm. Young, who would like to? I haven't asked lately. Young, very technical question here. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's not necessary to block MLF. Um, I think, in, in my experience, uh, I think probably Ivy and uh, Deborah can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, pretty much all the shall we have been tasting uh, in, in the past has gone, gone through MLF. But I think MLF is very closely re related to the, the pH level of the wine. Uh, so if your pH level is uh, is low, even you go through MLF, uh, the secondary aroma being created by MLF is not so obvious. So I think uh, being Chablis still in the end is still a region that is quite on the north uh, limit, limit of viticulture. So go through MLF uh, is very important for the stability of wine as well as uh, uh, approachability and uh, the drinkness of the wine. Uh, SO2, um, I think this is a very debatable question. Uh, I think, you know, Tina, I know Tina very well. She, uh, she probably likes to produce like Tama Pico and all these kind of <laughs> uh, more natural approach uh, producer. But again, I think uh, SO2 is a neutral word. SO2 is not a negative word. So I, if you use it rightfully, it does bring out the best of ones. Yeah. Deborah, um, Ivy, do you have anything to add here? No. Well, okay. Rebecca, mm -hmm. I'm now wishing I had uh, reviewed my book notes from my previous visit. But what, what I recall, of course, it's not surprising that SO2 rates are diminishing. And I think globally, there's an awareness of what flavors SO2 adds to a wine and that sort of uh, reductive kind of um, woolly 
aroma. I see less and less of that in Chablis, and I think it, it was historically perhaps a combination of the mm -hmm. sulfur in the wine, and I'm seeing more fruit. It actually was dampening the fruit, so I'm seeing more fruit in Chablis. Yeah. Um, in terms of MLF, uh, I'm just going from memory, I'm sorry, but what I recall is it was the Grand Cru producers that were perhaps blocking a bit of MLF in it, and it's probably because those beautiful slopes we saw in the opening video are well exposed to the sun. And uh, in that case, I think they like preserving a, a bit of that um, acidity. But this is in a region, I, this is in a region that needs to block MLF by any means. Yeah, okay. Thanks, and the next question is from Zachary Yu. Uh, what are the distinguishing characteristics of the Seven Climat of Chablis Grand Cru? How to recognize them blindly, uh, blindfold? <laughs> <laughs> Young, I think, uh, and, and, and Deborah. <laughs> Young <laughs> first. <laughs> okay, let me just taste again quickly. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's... Um, it, 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 well, we can do a whole new mass class on this. Yeah, that um, would be another one question. On this. But uh, but it's it's very difficult, honestly. I mean, I, I think uh, there's a few ones that uh, you can put in the group that uh, they are quite similar. Um, but if you really want to distinguish each clima, I think it takes years of experience. Honestly, myself, I, I couldn't even do it. You know? But there's certain certain group you can certain certain category you can put all this clima into. You know, uh, uh, for example, the clove is pretty much on its own. Um, uh, and uh, Blanchot is very probably the, the, the weakest of the weakest link of the seven climates, you know. So, and you, I don't know if I answer this question properly, but I think as long as you can taste them, you taste the quality, you see this is one who um, I think if you say okay, this might be more towards to the clove, or this might be more towards to the over the soup. You know, I think that's good enough already. I think um, the world of wine is so big, uh, we need to taste more wines. Um, mm -hmm. It's very lovely to just focus on Chablis and uh, be a pure Chablis expert, but uh, you know, don't, don't tie yourself into not being able, not being able to make seven climats on your plant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Deborah. Was the question about seven climats the, or the yes, vintages? Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's actually about the seven climats, uh, because today we, we focus ah. on the Chablis uh, village appellation. But uh, yeah, it's, it's about how to blind taste them together, uh, uh, you know, differentiate them, mm. which I think it's another master class that could <laughs> uh, serve this. Um, uh, agreed. Yeah. And uh, I. I think the main thing to understand about that uh, differentiating them really is the angle of the slope because mm -hmm. it, all the soils are fairly similar across the Grand Cru mm -hmm. and um, it's really a matter of uh, height on the slope and access to sunshine that makes, in my view, that really distinguishes the Grand Cru. And as I said when we started, the wonderful thing is there's only a handful, so they're actually kind of fun to memorize. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Um, it's again from Yu Kong Chao. Um, M. Moho in the beginning mentioned to the 2020 vintage has an early vegetative cycle. Is that an influence of, again, global warming or what normally causes an early vegetative cycle? Um, Ivy? Um, well, that means early bud burst, mm -hmm. so. Early bud burst means that you know you have you know a slightly warmer spring, and um, a, you know uh, that has the right the, the warmth is the warmth is the one factor that causes you know that starts the vegetative growth. So when you have a warm spring, then you have early bud burst, and then you have an early season. So that's um, that's what Anne was referring to. But you, when you have an early growth um, bud burst, then you have you know you are more prone to the frost um, risk, um, which comes a little bit later, you know, into you know April or you know sort of sometimes in May season so that's um that's the, I, I guess is, is that the the mm. that's the answer the question yeah it, it's uh, and also about um, the early vegetative cycle is it an in, is uh, it is indication global of global warming, global warming? Mm -hmm. well I think we've had a few like for example mm -hmm. 2017 was also an early 
sort of budber season. So mm -hmm. I guess sort of it just depends on the. Um, it's not a case of you know climate. Uh, it's, it's not global warming. It's more climate change. Some some months, you know, some years we have you know earlier bud bursts, and some years we have later bud bursts. For example, we mentioned that you know 2019 was a very late bud burst year. It was a late um, you know slow vegetative growth. So that's just um, that's just the way you know the weather the weather yeah. was. You know. And Go and back. there are, of course, uh, natural cycles, right, mm. Ivy? So. Uh, I mean, we used to say oh, in, where I grew up in vineyards, you know, if it was if it was a cold winter last year, it's going to be a, a warmer spring the following cycle. And we would also consider the rainfall. And uh, if we had a lot of rainfall, that would also, for the following year, change the cycle. So I think uh, it's a great question. Uh, global warming or climate change certainly will impact this uh, vegetation cycle. But also, there are natural rhythms that take place. Mm. Yeah, right. Thank you, guys. And, and then another question here is from Dirk Chan. Uh, he asks, uh, what is the style should a good shabli, what is the style that uh, a good shabli should deliver? I'll start. Yep, <laughs> Deborah. <laughs> because poor Yang has had to start every question. Uh, first of all, I don't want to lump shabli all into one bucket because there are different styles of shabli depending which origins, which slopes, um, and of course, which a ACs, uh, which categorizations they have. But I think the underlying thing is the two or three words <laughs> that Yang said at the beginning. And Chablis has a purity that is just astonishing. It's a, it's a forthright, clean, crisp, pure wine. Now, as of course you get into the Grand Cru, then it gets a bit more confusing because these are the riper styles. They might have a bit of oak aging. Um, and in that case, they're a little stylistically, I would say, different from, from the rest of the region. And so personally, I like to think of Grand Cru as a type of wine. And then uh, AC Chablis and Premier Cru as a different type of wine. Stylistically, to me, they're two different beverages. Mm -hmm. But they're both the purity. Yeah. The, the three words that Yang has mentioned, mm. right? Here yeah, I think, I think just, just, to jump, yeah, just to jump in here, I think uh, the, the, the minerality is really the hallmark. I think we all taste wine from all over the world, but I think the minerality of Chablis is really sometimes unmistakable. Even though we have different style of Chablis, for example, you have Louis Michel, who purely used stainless steel from the entry level all the way to the Grand Cru level. You have certain producers who are slightly forced to be having a slightly more new oak influence, like uh, Ping Song and, uh, and sometimes William Fab has slightly new oak in, 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 their, in their Grand Cru uh, level. But in, even in those wines that you can clearly sense the new oak influence, the minerality is, is still there. The minerality is still unmistakable. So I think you, no matter which style you, you have, the, the purely steely, you know, kind of uh, fresh style that is in standing still, or even those style associated with certain oak influence, uh, the minerality is always there. And I think that's, that's very important, uh, important for Chablis to preserve. Right. So um, that's all for the questions. And thank you for the questions and comments. And uh, it brings to the end of this session. Thank you very much, Deborah, Ivy, and Yang. And thank you for being with us today. Uh, make sure that if you are posting anything on social media, at a hashtag of Pure Chablis, and drink Chablis, be pure, and enjoy the great <coughs> wines. Thank you very much, guys. And then Yang is drinking. <laughs> yeah. 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 everyone. Sante. Stay safe and healthy. Bye. Bye. Thanks Cheers. for your time. Thanks for your time today. <laughs>